41 years ago, when my parents got married, my dad refused to smash the glass, a Jewish wedding tradition that symbolizes the destruction of Jerusalem's temples. A reminder that even during our happiest hours, there is still suffering to acknowledge. My dad, a Jew, would later recall his reasoning. Why does Judaism always have to be about suffering? Why couldn't our wedding just be a joyous occasion? His father-in-law-to-be, my grandfather, who I called Zeta, but was known to many as Rabbi Harold Spivak, <laughs> ended up breaking the glass anyway. <laughs> Zeta officiated the occasion in his kippah, a brimless cap worn to cover the head during Jewish ceremony. My dad wore one too, perhaps a compromise for his bride-to-be. They were wed that chilly day in early spring, 1981, in my grandparents, Bobby and Zeta's backyard. Four years later, my parents' first child was born, and four years after that, on June 8, 1989, I came around. Born a few minutes after midnight, the doctor muttered a frustration and jest upon my successful arrival. My parents asked him what could have been the matter if he was born a few minutes earlier, his birthday would have been six, seven, eight, nine. I was not born riding a motorcycle. <laughs> I was not born Fury Young. For the first 15 years of my life, I was UV Brosgold, an amalgamated name. Yuval means jovial in Hebrew, my mom's input, and Evie was my father's mom's nickname, short for Evelyn. Yuval plus Evi equals UV, phonetically ultraviolet, UV. There is a Native American tradition of changing your name to fit your personality as you grow. I liked the name UV, but it just wasn't me. Somehow it sat awkward, felt too round, not sharp, more like a name you'd give a pet. When I decided on fury, it did not mean anger, it meant passion, fury young. I wanted a simple last name, something that could perhaps still be Jewish, but complemented the first name. And it sounded cool. A Fury Young film. At the time, I wanted to be a film director. Five years before changing my name, a 10-year-old UV wrote, my passion is movies. Not just movies, but directing movies. <laughs> I've been into movies since age seven, and since age seven, I've also wanted to direct movies. So basically for three years. Now you might think I'm just interested and don't do much about it. Just wait for the time to come, but you're wrong. I have a friend named Forrest and his dad is a producer and his mom's a film editor. And soon we don't know yet, but I'm gonna go with his dad, Dean, and see how filmmaking works. I was an extra in For Love of the Game and Money Train, but I've been on TV about six times once without knowing it. I'm also writing a script for a movie I wish to make in the future. And now, since I'm getting more filmmaking, my parents are looking into film schools for me now. I have my whole life planned out already pretty much, realistically. <laughs> Fascinating how life shapes, ain't it? I don't know what happened to Forrest and his family. We lost touch. I did go to film school, a one-year vocational sort of thing, which ended up making me want to make movies less stifling my creativity with too many right ways of doing things. Not yet too deterred though, I started working in the film industry in the art department, doing props, set dressing, and carpentry at a set fabrication shop. I was a busy, hardworking 20 year old out in the world, paying my own bills in my first apartment, continuing to get more challenging and higher paying work, but I wasn't personally challenged. If I still wanted to be a great film director, what was my story? Working long hours making other people's movies until somehow I got to make my own one day? I decided to move to LA. There I would find part-time work in, in film and take a few community college classes in a wide variety of subjects like guitar and history, expanding my worldview and talents, having adventures and gaining life experiences that would inform my amazing future movies. It all worked out except the main goal. My big dream since seven, the thing I'd realistically had my whole life planned around. When I got to LA, it was the summer of 2011. 
I didn't know anybody there except for some distant cousins who I found bougie and snobby, a fitting intro to LA. Lonely and culture shocked, I looked forward to classes starting in September. One of the classes I enrolled in on a whim, 20th century genocide, would completely engulf me. Suddenly, my vivid cinematic ideas felt trifling next to the massive suffering in the world I'd become obsessed with learning about. Studying this history was like an avalanche of the human condition coming right at me. I began devouring books both assigned and extracurricular, books about Cambodia, Rwanda, Nanking, and the Holocaust, a genocide in which dozens of my ancestors didn't survive. Though I had no friends, I had a new passion. It was overwhelming and had only just begun. On September 17th, 2011, a group of protesters sent up a set up a tent city two miles from where I grew up in the Lower East Side and would not leave. They called themselves Occupy Wall Street. In a matter of days, tent cities had sprung up throughout the country and eventually around the globe. They were not just protesting income inequality, but a slew of issues, so many issues they were immediately criticized for lack of focus. Wall Street bailouts, foreclosures, climate justice, the military industrial complex, mass incarceration, police brutality, neoliberalism, capitalism, basically the whole damn system. I approached with caution, but with my newfound obsession of history and human tragedy mixed with an utter lack of community and or social life, I began attending what they called general assemblies at the tent city outside LA's city hall. I felt a part of something, fascinated by all these protest protesters who seemed like outsiders, like me. Fascinated by the different walks of life that called this country home, but felt disenfranchised from it, or just outright wanted to see it burn to the ground. Where did I stand? I wasn't sure yet, but I was desperate to find out. I started checking out more books from the library, books about capitalism, globalization, the Black Panther movement, the war in Iraq, I didn't have a focus. I just wanted to know everything. Soul on Ice, Panther Baby, The Shock Doctrine, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, The Lis Lucifer Principle. I was going a mile a minute with a convert zeal. Why make movies when there are people starving in the world? I wanted to do everything, to be a guerrilla fighter, to stop the next genocide, to join the revolution, to feed the hungry. In the process, I would maybe make a movie that blended all the different worlds I would encounter into the greatest film ever made. I wanted to live so many lives, I would even do so as a spy. And one day I signed up for a workshop to join the Marines. I never ended up going. When I look back at this time now, I mostly feel the loneliness. Yet my world was opening before me, exploding really. I remember one day after school, I asked every person I possibly could on the train ride home who they would be if they could spend one day in someone else's shoes. I got all sorts of answers. Obama, a porn star, Pink Floyd, Lil Wayne, Oprah, a family member. I was obsessed with talking to strangers and learning about new worlds. And I was also struggling with depression, questioning my self-worth. That December, three months into my history and activist vision quest, I wrote in a notebook, with every passing day, I feel the truth about the human world closer, most especially by reading about politics and history. I also feel less and less valid to tell my own story because should not a great storyteller have lived a great story. So my path is dictated by this idea. I lasted another seven months in LA through the winter into early summer. Or wait, I forgot, they don't have seasons. Come June, right around my 23rd birthday, I embarked on a cross-country Occupy, Occupy caravan with a certified Motley crew. We stayed at different Occupy encampments along the way, in Vegas, Albuquerque, New Orleans, Mobile, Richmond, all the way up to Philly for a July 4th national gathering. From there, a group of maybe 50 of us walked all the way to New York City, causing at least one car collision as we walked along the side of a New Jersey thoroughfare with our banners and acoustic guitars. That really happened. 
Crossing the Hudson towards Manhattan on the Staten Island Ferry, we saw the financial capital of the world approaching, glistening in its skyscraping glory. A crust punk next to me called out, man, fuck that city, fuck those buildings. <laughs> I wasn't sure what to think. That was my home. Getting off the ferry, a brigade of NYC occupiers came to welcome in our arrival with epic fanfare. Pots and pans banging, mic checks of glory and overshare, and chants like, shit's fucked up, shit's fucked up and bullshit. I hated that one at the time, but I kind of miss it now. We'd landed in the belly of the beast. This was where it all started, Occupy Wall Street. And you could feel the energy and inspiration buzzing like some kind of end-stage capitalism Woodstock. There were daily protests, affinity groups, affinity groups about affinity groups, teach-ins at Washington Square Park. You could hang with the crusties and nomads at Liberty Square or attend a heated discussion at Blue, Blue Stockings with the seasoned organizer types all in a day's work. I decided to stay. I had a community here family, old friends, and a feeling like I might make some new friends. I got a job at a coffee shop and started back up at my old wood shop, Sets and Effects, and with a stroke of New Yorker's luck, found a cheap rent controlled apartment in Bushwick. I enrolled at Kingsborough Community College with a focus on history and a few prerequisites that would allow me to transfer to a four-year CUNY. I was still exploring all types of history but I started focusing more on American because of my Occupy involvement and deep questions about this country that I'd spent the last year exploring. With my artistic dreams uncertain now, I was thinking maybe I'd even teach history one day. As a white Jew from a pre-gentrified Lower East Side on a block of majority Puerto Rican, Dominican, and Chinese neighbors, I always felt different, an outsider. Though my grammar school was super diverse, I would usually be the only Jewish kid, and I'd, I'd always have to explain Hanukkah in front of all my classmates. When a choir teacher pointed out that Ira Gershwin had been born in the neighborhood, I shouted out, yeah, on my block. When the teacher asked where I lived, I told him, I, didn't, I don't know. I was ashamed to live next to the projects. I didn't want people to think I was poor. As I got older and our south of Houston part of the neighborhood got cool, I started to have pride in where I was from and all the wonderful cultures I was raised around. Though I didn't grow up in a very black neighborhood, I probably related to the black experience in American history the most because I'd always felt like an outsider myself. And reading books like A People's History of the United States, Soul on Ice, Panther Baby, and Harriet Tubman's narratives, I was deeply moved by black freedom struggles throughout American history. There was recently, there was a recently published book at the time that kept popping up at libraries and bookstores that I would visit. I distinctly remember the first time I saw it at Los Angeles City College, picked out as a must read on special display. On the cover was a tight close up of a black person's hands gripping tightly to prison bars. Released two years into Obama's first term, the book was called The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. I'd been in New York a few months and I'd been bouncing around different Occupy affiliated groups. I'd found most of them full of heated debate but lacking direction, often as frustrating as they were interesting. When I picked up the new Jim Crow, I had a feeling it was going to hit me. A mentor of mine from the neighborhood who I made a film about and had since become like family, Alexander Pridgen, used to recount to me prison stories from his days at Clinton, a max facility near the Canadian border. This was where he discovered spirituality as a Muslim. My black and Puerto Rican buddies at the woodshop had all done time talking about it like going to prison was a casual occurrence. Quite earnestly, once my coworker Moses asked if I'd ever done a bid and I just thought to myself, huh? I might have been from a low income neighborhood and certainly had my kleptomaniac drug testing days in high school, but prison? Years away from society in a cell? 
Never in a million years, Moses. I didn't say it like that. I started reading the new Jim Crow one night on an almost empty subway car ride home. The first paragraph made my eyes well up. It felt all too real and close to home too, different than reading about Rwanda or Cambodia. It began. Jarvis Cotton cannot vote. Like his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and great-great-grandfather, he has been denied the right to participate in our electoral democracy. Cotton's great-great-grandfather could not vote as a slave. His great-grandfather was beaten to death by the Ku Klux Klan for attempting to vote. His grandfather was prevented from voting by Klan intimidation. His father was barred from voting by poll taxes and literacy tests. Today, Jarvis Cotton cannot vote because he, like many black men in the United States, has been labeled a felon and is currently on parole. I couldn't put the book down, though it lacked more stories as personal and moving as Jarvis's, I read the book carefully and passionately transcribing sections along the way. I was starting to feel something percolating in my head. I wanted more of Jarvis though. I loved Michelle Alexander's writing, but I wanted to hear from the people inside, the folks living this so-called new Jim Crow. What did they have to say about it? Though I'd become somewhat of a history bookworm, I'd found a new love in writing poetry and songs, and I'd carry my guitar around everywhere, trying to get better quickly. Back in my film-obsessed days, the features I would envision would use music in exciting and powerful ways, like getting on a roller coaster of emotion right there in your chair. Around the time I was reading The New Jim Crow, I'd also gotten into a British prog rock band, Pink Floyd, and their political, trippy, maniacal landscapes pulled me right the fuck in. They injected me with a part of my soul that had gone missing. Their music was intensely, viscerally, almost violently cinematic. I didn't start with The Wall, an epic double album which was made into a feature film three years after it came out in 79. But when I got there, I made sure I was ready. I prepared a long walk for myself, walking over the Williamsburg Bridge and listening to parts one and two back to back in their entirety. I loved the format and the themes explored. This traumatized rock star builds a wall to hide himself from his audience, locking himself away deep into his own paranoia until he eventually becomes a genocidal warlord. It was political, psychotic, lonely, grand, the story of a man in mental prison. One day on the way to Kingsboro, about halfway through the new Jim Crow, I started to take seriously this idea of making a concept album like The Wall. It would be about prison, about being black in America and getting caught up in the system. Being from a neighborhood like mine was as a kid, but worse, minus the bohemian artists and 10 times the drugs and violence with the Met and MoMA, not an express train away, but in an unknown universe. I would work with currently and formerly incarcerated people all across the country, not just in the coastal elite cities where I lived, but everywhere. The album would give first-person voices to prison-impacted musicians and writers, and I'd somehow gain access to prisons and record some of these artists right there on the inside. Others I would record after being released. It would start in the 1820s with a farcical Jim Crow character who would reappear throughout in mysterious ways, jumping into the 1970s and following the rise of mass incarceration and its effect on black communities nationwide. The album would be as epic and impactful as The Wall and as historically revealing as the new Jim Crow, smashing stereotypes about race and prison in America <laughs> like glass at a Jewish wedding. <laughs> it would take months for me to find the title, but I decided to call it 
die Jim Crow. Thank you.